again, we'll spend our time this morning, and uh, the scriptures are uh, indeed a, a gift to us. They are a, a connection. They are the word of God that has been passed down across millennia. Uh, they are a plumb line, if you will, or a stake in the ground that helps us make sure that we know uh, that we're not veering too far off from the purposes of God in our lives. And uh, the, the Word of God, particularly during the season of consecration, uh, can be a great gift if we study and allow the Word of God to minister to our hearts. One of the uh, early African church fathers, his name was uh, Augustine, St. Augustine. He says that the Word of God will be your adversary until it becomes the author of your salvation. Amen. And uh, that, 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 that is, uh, for me, one of the most powerful expressions of, of the, both the hopefulness and the challenge of the Word of God in our lives. Because how many of you know you can't just read the part of the Bible that you like and then throw the rest of it out? Amen. That if you take it all very serious, uh, it will leave none of us off the hook. Mm -hmm. And so uh, folk who feel like they got such a great corner on God, I get a little nervous uh, because uh, all of us at every point of our lives are in need of the radical mercy and grace of God. And one of the great ways in which we hear and learn and know how we can indeed be more faithful to God is through the word of God that has been given to us uh, through the tradition of our church, through the anointed vessels that God spoke to, and certainly through the collective interpretation and application of we the church in this moment in time. So Isaiah chapter 55 is a great uh, whole chapter. I won't get a chance to read all of it because, I'm sorry, preach all of it or else we'll be here all day. And I know that for many of us, there are other appointments you have today. Uh, uh, and uh, I will, so we'll have a, a few weeks to work out this soul food sermon. But I want to read the whole chapter because I think just reading the word of God may actually bless you just as much as me preaching the Word of God. Anybody ever read, read a scripture and it was the first time you read it and something inside of you just jumped? <laughs> he, was, he was like, da 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 It's like, ooh. And, he, and, and you didn't need to get a whole lot of extra commentary. Amen. Anybody ever had that experience? Amen. I, I kind of get that experience every time I read the sermon passage, even while I'm up here preaching. You know, I spend all week reading and studying and trying to figure out what I'm going to communicate. And, and then I get up here and read, and then I'd be like, my God, how did I miss that all week long? It is because the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light unto our path. So get in your Word this month, and uh, let's see how these words bless us today. Isaiah 55, verse 1 through 13. We're reading from the, I think, the message version today. Yep the message version, and uh, I'll go back and forth to the New Revised Version, but the message is uh, one of the great paraphrases of uh, the original text, and I think it helps some of us to perhaps uh, get a little bit closer to some meaning uh, for our contemporary moment. Isaiah 55, the Word of God says, hey there, everybody say hey. hey. All who are thirsty, everybody say all. Everybody say everyone. Y'all forgot the everyone. Mm-hmm. All who are thirsty, come to the water. Are you penniless? Come anyway, buy and eat. Come buy your drinks, buy wine and milk, buy without money. Everything is free. Why do you spend your money on junk food? Ouch. Your hard-earned cash on cotton candy. Get your hands out of my pocket. Listen to me. Listen well Eat only the best. Fill yourself with only the finest. Pay attention. Come close now. Listen carefully to my life-giving, life-nourishing words. For I'm making a lasting covenant commitment with you. The same that I made with David. It is sure, solid, enduring love. I set him up as a witness to the nations, made him a prince and leader of the nations. Listen to this. And now I'm doing it for you. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God's doing it for me. God's doing it for me. 
What is God doing for you? You'll summon nations you've never heard of. And nations who've never heard of you will come running to you. Because of me, your God, because the Holy One of Israel has honored you. Verse number six, seek God while he's here to be found. Pray to him while he's close at hand. Let the wicked abandon their way of life and the evil their way of thinking. Let them come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. I don't think the way you think, this is God talking now, it's not me. I don't think the way you think, the way you work isn't the way I work. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Because some of y'all got some problems that only God can work out. Hmm? How many of y'all tried everything? And everything has failed. And now all you got left to do is to try who? Touch your neighbor. Amen. See, I didn't even have to preach that. I just preached all by itself. The way you work is the way I work. Why? For as the sky soars high above earth, so the way I work surpasses the way you work. And the way I think is beyond the way you think. Man, what am I reading up here? This thing is fire. Just as rain and snow descend from the skies and don't go back until they've watered the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossom, producing seed for farmers and food for the hungry, listen, so will the words that come out of my mouth not come back empty-handed. They'll do the work I sent them. They'll complete the assignment I gave them. How, this, is a rich, this is a rich chapter, amen? I've got a few more verses. So you'll go out in joy. You'll be led into a whole and complete life. The mountains and hills will lead the parade. Bursting with song, all the trees of the forest will join the procession, exuberant with applause, no more thistles but giant sequoias, no more thorn bushes but stately pines. I love these last two verses. You will be monuments to me, to God, living and lasting evidence of God. Oh, come on, somebody. Let's thank God for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. All right, we're going to use the remaining moments of our time to speak from the topic simply, soul food. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word of God. That has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Somebody tell your neighbor, I need some soul food. I need some soul food. Now, I will argue that one of the greatest and most difficult challenges you and I will ever undergo is radical change. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, any kind of change, I'm talking about all change. Because for as much as we say that we want things to be different in our lives, in our families' lives, in the world around us, how many of you know that change, when it shows up at our front door, will often cause a level of disorientation cause a level of confusion, dizziness, vertigo, for many of us, that will make you kind of wish for the good old days that weren't so good. <laughs> Hello, somebody. Why? Because many of us get used to the mess and the challenge and the kind of, you know, difficulties that 
our past, whether it is an immediate or a distant past, often has brought in our lives. And, and, and then for a season of our life, the, the, the moment be, between uh, where I am now and where I am seeking God to take me, take us, requires a level of trust and faith that often we don't currently have at the moment. Hello, somebody. Uh, the faith that brought you to this point is the same faith that will lead you on, but that faith will often have to be cultivated in a different kind of way. And the process of that cultivation is what will cause you and I to change. You mean, uh, you know, you mean, Pastor Mike, that, that uh, you know, I, I, have to, I have to have a different kind of faith? Not necessarily a different kind of faith. You have to have a more developed faith. A, a faith that, that is more deeply grounded beyond the surface, beyond the cliches, beyond the four walls of the building, beyond if the preacher says what you want to hear, beyond if they sing your song, beyond if, you know, uh, 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 your, your mom and them like you, beyond if you have your nice uh, dream job, beyond if your marriage is going great, beyond if you are healthy in your body, you got to have a faith that goes deeper than your circumstance. And that faith, my, <laughs> that faith, Ooh, that faith don't just happen. You got to, as the scripture says, work out your salvation. You know what it means to work it out? Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm getting back into my workouts. And, 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 and I, I'm so excited about working out until I do. <laughs> Ooh, I'll be all night. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to work out. Oh, I'm going to go hit that elliptical machine, and I'm going to do all these, these, these exercises. And then when I wake up and go into the next room and lay down on my back to try to do a sit-up, <laughs> all of my commitment and enthusiasm for change, it, it just seeps right on out on the first try, just zzzz. And then I got to dig deeper. Hello, somebody. I got to dig deeper than, than whatever I was depending on laying in my bed in a state of comatoseness. Is that a word? Catatonic. What, just, just laying there vegging out. That faith or that, that desire ain't going to be the same desire that's going to cause me to do 100 sit-ups in five minutes. Who gave me these workout plans? Amen. <laughs> it's just unreasonable. But I'm going to keep trying, amen. If, if y'all find me dead on the ground laid out, it's because my heart gave out. Because my spirit was willing, but this old flesh. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you see, part of what I want to submit to you today is that all of us engaging in this season of consecration, must appreciate that there is a certain kind of soul food, soul work that you and I must be willingly engaging in if we are going to have the kind of sustainable faith, power, dare I say hope, we need to make it through this season of difficulty, season of challenge, season of, for many of us, hardship. And all of you that are feeling all right, you need to store it up for a rainy day. Because, I mean, you know, 2017 has some things coming that you will not anticipate. And, and you know, uh, it's raining outside. Wouldn't it have been something? Y'all know the story of Noah and the Ark, right? Everybody know the story of Noah and the Ark? Nobody raising their hand? Amen? Okay. <laughs> About to say, we may have to start in Genesis, praise God. 
Forget this soul food. We're going to have to just start a study from Genesis 1. In the beginning. No. Noah, God came to Noah early on, right? Told him, I'm getting ready to send the flood. God didn't tell Noah, like, when the water started to fall. Hey, Noah, guess what? It's getting ready to rain. <laughs> build, no. Some of us wait to build the ark when the rain starts falling. But how many of you know, in, the, in, in I think it was Hebrews 11 or 12, my brother used this passage a lot when we talk to these folks all across the country, that God showed Noah that the rain was coming and Noah built an ark for the saving of his household. And so for all of us in here who are claiming to have influence or stewardship over yourself, over your family, over your community, it is incumbent upon us in this moment to start building the ark of hope and faith that will allow us to be able to hopefully provide a shelter and a pathway to salvation for the saving of those whom we know and love. Because somebody's building an ark that may not have your family and loved one's best interest in mind. And wouldn't it be something if all of us who follow the ways of Jesus would take seriously the warning that he's providing us, the heads up. Aren't you glad when you get a heads up? Listen, I'm giving you a heads up now. Then, then when that thing happens, you ain't just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, no, I kind of got a heads up so at least I can brace myself for that which is to come. I want to submit to you that the text in Isaiah is speaking to the children of Israel who have just come out of a season of exile. Why? Because they didn't follow through on their covenant responsibility. So the scriptures and the, the way uh, the children of Israel tell it, God allowed their enemies to take them into exile. Because they didn't appreciate the land flowing with milk and honey that God gave them. God said, okay, if you want to appreciate it, then we're going to give you a little time out from this promise. And how many of you know, uh, as my dad used to tell us, you don't miss the water till the what? Well runs dry. Then you're down there trying to scoop up some water and there ain't nothing in there but, but, but dust and dirt and rocks. How many of you know dust don't quench your thirst? Rocks don't go down as smooth. Mm-hmm. So many of us, God has placed us in a, the place we've prayed for. God's given you and I access to that which we've been preparing our whole lives for, and yet sometimes we forget God. We forget to cultivate the things of God. We forget to engage in the practices that have actually helped get us to this point. That's why a consecration is so necessary, because it is the reset button, or at least the hard stop, that many of us need to make sure we don't get too far out there on our own strength, our own ideas, our own learning, that we forget that if it had not been for the Lord. And I got to tell you, you know, I'm not, I'm not exempt from any of this. I, I was meeting with one of the bishops while I was down south, just asking the bishop, please pray for me because sometimes I feel like I'm losing my mind. Because you can be so filled with all these different kinds of influences, impacted from all these different kinds of ideas, that you forget that it was the Lord that brought us over. Hello, somebody. Soul food, soul work, it prepares you and I for the sustainability of our unique call and effort. And just like the prophet had to speak to the children of Israel, I hear the word of God coming to us today. And what is the word of God saying? Listen, everyone who is thirsty, come. That's the first thing that we'll lift up today. Uh, where are you eating? We're going to talk about some soul food. 
Where are you eating? Think about that for a second. In the verse, it says, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Now, it is important to appreciate, my loved ones, that not all tables are meant for you to eat at. In this season of consecration, and hopefully the consecration will have some legs and it won't just end on January 29th. Hopefully, you know, you'll be able to sustain it. You and I will not be able to just eat at every table if you're going to remain, remain having the soul food you need. Now, I, I'm going I'm to I'm have to go a little ways on this point because, uh, you know, for many of us, uh, the where are you eating question, we think, has to uh, only serve us the food that you like. And this is a part of the failure, I, or at least the limitation, of a society that has become so consumer-driven right, where we only eat what we like, go where we feel comfortable, uh, uh, hang around those that look like us, believe what we believe, right? And when there's ever a difference, then all hell is breaking loose. But could it be that the house of God is a place, if the scriptures say that the house of God will be a house for all nations, a house where difference finds a way to coexist. That the house of God is a place where you don't get to pick who comes through the front door. Can you imagine you went into a restaurant? I don't know what you meant, Cheesecake Factory. You went into Cheesecake Factory. And you said, I don't want you in this restaurant if I'm going to eat here. <laughs> Wait a second. Is this your, is this your restaurant? What's going on? Ain't you, you, <laughs> you come here to eat just like everybody else. Isn't it interesting that in many of our churches and our communities that we are majoring in excluding rather than including everyone who thirsts? Now, I, I, I want to say to you that it's very difficult to follow this scripture, particularly the everyone part. <laughs> Because, you know, it'd be like, I only want the black folk who thirsty. The rest of y'all, y'all better go find somewhere else. Now, you know, you could have that preference, but you wouldn't be following this scripture. I want to submit that one of the things that you and I maybe as a mental image when we're thinking about this season of soul food and soul work is how do you and I imagine that there are many tables in the house of God and there may be many different folks sitting at these tables eating some different soul food, but at least they're in the house eating some soul food. How many of you know that God has a menu for all of us that uh, may be a little different at the season of our life than the person sitting next to you? I'm trying to help y'all to just get a mental image around how to be more inclusive around people who are different. Because the church can't be known for who we exclude. Because God did not exclude us. So my thing is, if people want to come into the restaurant and get this soul food, even if you don't like what they're eating, stay at your table. Order, order your food. Pray that the, the chef back there will put the right things in there. But don't kick nobody else out of the restaurant when they're coming to try and get the same soul food that you're seeking. They could be gay. They could be a formerly incarcerated person. 
They could be a different race. They can be from Afghanistan. They could be an Arab, a Muslim. I don't care who they are. If the house of God is to be the place for all nations and all peoples, I want the church, our church, you, the body of Christ, to be practicing in this season, what does it mean to make sure on the front door of our person, we have the everyone sign. All who are thirsty. And then leave, leave, leave the meal up to the chef. You come and get your food. If you're there to work, you serve. But don't you dare start locking people out. And make sure, you know, how you present the gospel, amen? Don't offend folks so much that they won't even eat the food before you put it in front of them. I remember the Cosby show. Y'all remember the Cosby show? Y'all remember when Sandra, was that Sandra and Elvin? No, who was that? That was Denise. Was that Denise? No, that was Vanessa. <laughs> Went through all the kids, Amen. Vanessa and Dabner, y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? Vanessa and y'all, the Cosby Show. I know, I know he, he, he's a pretty problematic character in these days with all these, these rape charges, amen, and that's, that's tragic, so I'm not trying to trigger nobody around all that. But the Cosby Show was a very powerful, powerful expression of a whole lot of things, so I'm going to use this analogy and get off the Cosby Show real quick. But I remember, <laughs> I remember Vanessa and Dabner, you know, Vanessa show up with Dabner, and, you know, uh, Dabner, don't nobody know who he is. I think Vanessa like 21, and according to Dabner, he... Knocking on 40, amen. And you know, the dad was like, you know, he's like, uh, Cliff was like, what in the world's going on? And, and Claire was just been out of shape, and everybody was just, just having a hard time. So they sit at the table, and, 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 and Cliff says, you know, uh, Dabner, my problem is not with you. My problem <laughs> is with how you were brought to me. So he says, what, what's your favorite uh, food? He said, a T-bone steak. He said, mm, yeah, T-bone steak. And you have it like cooked real good, mm, yeah, with mushrooms and all the fixes, mm, yeah, with some side of potatoes, mm, yeah, and, you know, just saliv salivating, mm, good, right? Now say rather than a plate, I take the top of a garbage can and I turn the garbage can top over and I put the steak on the garbage can and try to give it to you like that. So it wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't sound so tasty then, would it? Probably not. You should not present this soul food to those who are hungry on the top of a garbage can lid. Because that is not how God brought this faith to us. The scripture says it was through love and kindness has God drawn us. Hello, somebody. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him, I'm going to draw you with some love. I'm going to draw you with some kindness. So, so the first question, if you're going to get some of this soul food, is your place somewhere where everyone can eat? How do you and I learn to embrace the others in our lives? All those folk who, who don't fit in our circle of concern. Can you and I make sure that... If, 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 if we're going to be consecrating ourselves, God, at the end of this consecration, let me be more comfortable with difference. And that's, going, that's hard for me. We were talking about, you know, the campaign and the election and all these, these enemies, folks, I consider to be enemies of my soul and body that I got to work with. Jesus. And, 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 and I remember Dr. West told me, he said, Brother McBride, Brother McBride, Brother McBride. Always keep the porch light on because some of your enemies may actually come home to be your friends. Can you keep the porch light on for the people in your family, in your neighborhood, on your job, in your community that right now are your antagonists, but God, through the power of God's spirit, may be drawing them to a place of healing and wholeness. And, 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 and you may be the only person. The scripture says this later on. Nations you do not know will be drawn to you. So if they come in your way, why are you going to lock them out? If God is already telling you in this season, if you set yourself apart, you will be a magnet. 
But you ain't going to attract nobody if you reminding them of the worst thing you think they've ever done. Well, you, 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 you a thief. You a drug dealer. You a this, you a that. Oh, I, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. Uh, can I still come over to eat? They'll be like, man, who are you, you know? When I'm with the San Quentin, brothers in there, we sit around in a circle, and they are already aware of why they're there. <laughs> I need to go in there and talk to the brother San Quentin. Yeah, man, you a murderer. <laughs> like, okay, well, I got some practice, McBride, you know. Like, what's your point? Like, you came all the way into San Quentin to remind me of why I'm in bondage. No, 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 no. I'm coming to help hopefully be an agent of healing and be healed myself. You and I will be healed when all of us can inhabit some spaces together. Hello, somebody. Second thing that the verse lifts up, what's in your wallet? If you're going into the soul food space, What's in your wallet? Verse 1, come by without money and without price. And I want to submit to you and I that there is an economy of God that is different than the economy of this world. You see, this world, this capitalistic society that, that depends on scarcity, phew, depends on there not being enough. Depends on making sure that there's a formula for profit is not the way God invites you and I to participate in this soul food, soul work process. God says, come and buy even if you don't have any money. So what do you buy with? Let's keep on reading. Let's see what, what this verse says in verse number, verse number, verse number, hmm, uh, verse, let's see, verse, verse number, uh, 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 verse number four, something like that, somewhere around in that area. It says, listen to me, listen well, only eat the best, fill yourself with only the finest. This is to me what I believe is the, the, the spiritual currency. Uh huh. The spiritual currency that you and I must bring to the table if we are indeed going to benefit from this kind of opportunity. It says that you must first listen. You that have an ear, can you listen? Rather than you that have a, a bank account filled with cash, do you have an open ear? Spiritual currency. The way God transfers this soul food to us is about the openness of your hearing. So when God speaks, can you hear what God is saying? Listening is a spiritual currency in the economy of God. Now, this raises a question. What are you listening to? Now, y'all know that's a real question. Because you can be listening to stuff that you didn't even, like, you know, intend to hear. You ever been walking by something and you be like, all of a sudden you walking, just minding your own business, and all of a sudden like your ear drags you like this way and you just nosy all up in somebody's business and somebody's conversation. And they call it ear hustling. <laughs> and then you wish you hadn't heard what you heard. But it's, uh, it's very difficult to unring that bell. Ain't it interesting that it's so easy to ear hustle on the negative things? But it's a little difficult to ear hustle on what is God saying. In the economy of God, you got to have a listening ear in your wallet. In the economy of God, Lord have mercy, you have to pay attention to what God is doing. In the economy of God, you have to draw near to God. Close some gaps. Move toward God. 
So in a traditional sense, you may be going to a restaurant trying to figure out how I'm going to pay for this food. You pull out your MasterCard, pull out your Visa, pull out your cash. Boom, it's paid for. But in the economy of God, God said, I don't need your money. I don't want your money. I want you. I want your ear. I want your heart. I want your mind. Are you giving that to God in this season of consecration? So you can hear God. So you can see God. So you can be attentive to what God is doing. This is why some of these disciplines are so important. Because for many of us, that muscle of hearing and seeing and being nearer to God has been atrophied. You know what an atrophied muscle is, right? Is shriveled up. It is useless. It has no strength. But am I going to sit at this table and, and, and make sure that my soul is being nourished? God, I got to be open to what you're saying. That's why we're telling some of us we need to get off Facebook and we need to stop watching all these crazy shows and, and listen to some of this foolish music. Not because it's inherently evil, although some of it is a challenge. I'm not going to preach on your music or your shows or your other stuff today, man. I'm just going to tell you, why don't you take some time to look inside your account and make sure that you're filled up with the listening, the seeing, the closeness to God. Prayer helps you to hear God. Worship helps you, helps you to draw nearer to God. Service to others helps to change your wicked heart. I always tell folk, in this season, whoever you don't like, serve them. Just try it. Or serve someone like them. Because <laughs> how many know everybody got a clone? Touch your neighbor, amen. <laughs> Find the most mean person in your office and just try to serve them. Say, hey, I brought you some coffee today. I don't know why you bring me no coffee. You don't, you don't even know what I like in my coffee. I don't like coffee. I like tea. Your response should be like, well, forget your coffee. And, you know, <laughs> take some notes. Come back the next day with some tea. I brought you some tea today. See, they, they, you'll be surprised how serving some folk you don't like in this season of consecration may actually change the part of you. Oh, Lord, I don't know what I'm up here talking about. This has got to be the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because I don't want no part of it. I'm going to give your neighbor a high five and just tell him real quick. What's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? What's in your wallet? Do you have the spiritual currency necessary? Do you have it necessary? Do you have the spiritual currency necessary? Are you listening to God? Are you paying attention to what God is doing? Are you filling yourself with that which is good? It says, fill yourself with that which is good. Are you closing the gaps of distance between you and God's will and God's work? I'm going to do this last one. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them today. We'll pick it up next week final thing that we'll lift up today, which appetites are you feeding? Verse 2, eat what is good, delight yourselves in rich food. Everybody say this after me. What I feed the most will have the most power over me. What you feed the most will have the most power over you. And in this season of consecration, some of us need to starve some parts of us to death. Hello, somebody. You feed your anger, guess what? You're going to be an angry person. Anger is not inherently bad or terrible. The scripture says, be angry and sin not. So that means that anger is a human emotion. Folks tell me all the time when he's out there protesting, you shouldn't be angry. You're like, well, how about this? I'm human. God gave me anger, and I'm going to use it. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You better pray for me, though, that I don't sin. If you worried about <laughs> Y'all, forgive me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Be angry and that means that there's some limits that you as a follower of the ways of Jesus must be careful not to cross. And for many of us, me included, we are in a season of justified anger, outrage. We have injustice that is overflowing into our families. I'm not supposed to be sitting around here skipping and whistling like I'm like rolling through the prairie. That ain't not, that's not, not for the people I know and love. We got folk who can't live in the area where their great grandparents lived because housing, a arbitrary, you know, a house has no value beyond that which everybody determines. There are folk who bought a house 30 years ago for $20,000. And that same house all of a sudden is worth a million dollars. You ain't did nothing to that house to make that house a million, but live in it. That'd be like you going, you, you know, how many of you buy a car? The moment you drive it off the lot, the car loses its value. You use the car and the car loses its value. You live in a house, but depending on the neighborhood you're living in, the house will become so expensive that nobody can afford to live in it. Even the taxes on your house can be more than the rent on your house. We got folk losing their homes because the taxes can't afford the taxes. Why? Because everybody wants to live in the neighborhood now all the houses is going up. That's unjust. Am I supposed to be happy that folk are losing their homes? Our loved ones in jails and prisons for smoking and selling marijuana. Now it's a billion dollar industry. Am I supposed to be happy that they languishing in jail? That they've been exposed to all kind of violence behind the jail walls for doing the same activity that now folk will make billions of dollars over? Not supposed to be, not be angry about that. The devil is a liar. I'm going to be angry. And you ought to be angry too. But what does it mean? For you and I to make sure that our anger is being channeled in righteous ways. Our anger is not consuming us like it consumed Anakin Skywalker and turned him to the dark side. Mm -hmm. Because how many know your anger, those feelings, if they are left unchecked, can consume us and turn us to a side of the struggle? where you actually become the enemy of that which you are actually fighting for. This season of consecration then invites you and I to wrestle with this question. What appetite are you feeding? What needs to change in your diet for you to feed the right part of yourself? What are the practices that you and I have to intentionally engage in so your soul is being fed, not just your mind. Your heart is being fed, not just your body. God, in this season of consecration, may the food that I eat minister to my soul. May it have the right kind of balance. I was, I was, you know, looking at my, my, my dietary chart guide, and it was fascinating because, you know, I thought I could just eat fruit. You know, so I'd just be eating fruit all day long. Fruit, 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 fruit. Fruit, I wake up, eat fruit. Get, get hungry, eat fruit. Just eat fruit. And, 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 and one of the guides said that you should not mix certain fruits if you want your body to... Uh, uh, process and get all of the nutrients out of whatever you eat. There's some at, some subacid fruits, acid fruits, sweet fruits. I didn't know none of this. 
So, you know, I like strawberries. I like bananas. I like blueberries. I don't like cantaloupes or melons. They make my tongue itch for some reason, so I don't eat none of that kind of stuff. I like pineapples. I like apples sometimes. I like grapes. So I just be eating fruit. <laughs> I can just grab a whole, just a fistful of fruit, and I'm just like, cool. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but 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 the, the dietary chart said that I shouldn't eat acidic and sub-acidic fruits together. Said if I want a real smooth kind of uh, uh, impact in my body because my digestive system can work overtime to process certain things. That thing was fascinating to me, right? Because it reminded me that there is a method to this madness that there is an order to how our spiritual and even our physical bodies can be maximized. So I said, if you want to eat some, some fruit that will catalyze your system, eat cantaloupe and melons. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so I had to ask myself, is my itchy tongue for 10 seconds, can I endure that so the rest of my day, I can have a better, well-regulated digestive system. That thing bothered me all week. I didn't try to mail it until yesterday because it's like I got to build myself up for this itchiness tongue. But I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to think about this for a second. What are the parts of you that you need to balance out? There's a reason why worship is important in your dietary, your soul food menu. There's a reason why you should be able to lift your hands in the house of God. If you can't do that, ask yourself why. Well, I'm worried about what the person next to me is going to think. Well, so that's a good thing to ask God to free you from. Because how many know what the person next to you think? <laughs> Not just at church, but in a lot of part of your lives, we hung up on what the person next to you think while we are trying to do the right thing. God, free me from the opinions of folk who do not want my best interest. Now, I hope you caught the qualifier there because people talk about their haters all the time. I try not to preach on nobody's haters because I think that is such a small thing. Yo, haters, if you got a hater, so what? <laughs> like, my dad, like my dad said, don't nobody love you but me and your mama. Amen. And you're pushing your luck, son. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> what, did the, what did the jazz artist say? Don't nobody love me but my mama, and she may be jiving too, right? You're going to have people all around you probably for the rest of your life that aren't going to like you. The sooner you get free from them folk, the more free you will be to do the will of God. I can't pray because my mind, it just wanders on to what I got to do the rest of the day. It, it, you know, I start thinking of all these other ideas. That's a reason for you to pray more. Learn the discipline of prayer so you can train your mind to focus on the things of God. I can't serve folk because I've been hurt. I don't know what they're going to do means you need some healing. You see, you got to feed these parts of yourself actively or you and I will not have the nourishment we need for the season God is bringing us into. And I, for one, I want to be whole. I want us to be whole. I don't want us to be fragments of who we could be. I want us to be whole, lacking nothing. So God can use us. So God can live in us. So God can work in us. Come on, stand with me to the feet.